Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show. I'm your host, Paul, and in this video, we're breaking down Gen V. The first three episodes have just dropped on Amazon, and throughout this video, we're going to be breaking them down, talking about all the Easter eggs, comic book characters, and things you might have missed when watching the show. I'm a massive boys fan, read the comics so many times, watched the show over and over, and yeah, this video, it's going to be one of the most in-depth things we've ever done. Heavy spoilers ahead, and we will be covering this each and every week, so if you're new here, hit the subscribe button to never miss a video. Without the way, huge thank you for clicking this. Now let's get into Gen V Episode 1. Now the series actually starts off 8 years ago, when A-Train was first drafted into the 7. This is presented on the VSN Sports Network, and this being like a sporting event makes sense due to A-Train's power set. In Season 1, he ended up having a race and was picked to be the speedster of the group due to him filling in some gaps power set-wise. Now, due to the news ticker on the bottom, we learn that he was handpicked by Clancy Brown's Brinkerhoff, who we see throughout this entry is working on his next protege. Brinkerhoff itself is a learning method involving analysing one's success and failures, and this is so that a person can become their best. The university is also called God U, and this is because they're pretty much creating gods. Duh. Now there's a deeper meaning for this, as the full name for it Godolkin pulls from the comics, and it may hint towards what's happening in the woods. We will talk about that later on in the spoiler filled section, so I'll not ruin that if you're still reading the comics. Now in the reports, we also see the original 17 filled with Lamplighter and translucent to the right. Lamplighter actually is a bit photoshopped in there, with his image originally being used in Season 1 and featuring Starlight. Now A-Train is the first black member of the team, and thus his arrival is pretty big news. It's obviously ripping off Barack Obama's election, and at one point Madeleine Stilwell even says we live in a post-racism world now. Which, uh Now Stilwell is once more played by Elizabeth Shue, who you'll probably remember from that first season. Rest well. You made my day. In the comics, James Stilwell was the CEO of Vought, and if you ask me, he was actually the most threatening guy in the entire thing. Stilwell was actually gender swapped so that she and Homelander could have a thing, and this, this goes to prove we live in a post-sexism world, which... Ooh. Now this is also a memorable day for our main character Marie Moreau, as it's the day her powers manifest and she kills her parents. Marie Moreau is of course a name using the classic comic alliteration for a character name, and she's actually appeared in The Boys before. During season 3, when Huey and Annie visited the Red River Institute, we had a moment where the former hacked the computer system. One of the profiles there was actually Marie setting things up for what's to come here. Now we catch her and her sister taking a photo, which shoutouts to our editor Matt for spotting, this is based on a Kendall Jenner picture. It was Matt who spotted it, I, I swear it wasn't me, I didn't have anything to do with it. Now the character ends up having a period which also manifests into her powers and she's unable to control them. In case you don't know, the whole thing with Godolkin in the comics was basically a play off Xavier's school for gifted youngsters. Training the G-Men, John Godolkin ran a team of youths, which he was tasked with infiltrating and keeping an eye on. He managed to do it, but realised they were just a bunch of kids who were complete morons that didn't hit the thumbs up button. I'll talk in the spoiler section about the end what happened with them, but it was more like a boarding school rather than a university. However, the X-Men metaphors are still strong throughout, with their powers manifesting upon a big moment in puberty. This scene, it kinda reminded me a bit of the one with Rogue from the first X-Men film, and her powers there were brought on by her first kiss. Going back to the 90s, come, come with me, come with me mate, but there was actually an X-Men movie called Gen X, which is titles also clearly riffing off of. Wasn't very good, but here yeah, Marie's first period comes with her ability to manipulate blood, which can be used as a tool or weapon. Upon killing her parents, her sister's the only survivor, and we learn that she might still blame her for what went down. We cut to present day, and we then see as Marie wakes up in the Red River Academy. We can catch someone suspended up their bed, floating in their sleep, and this is something Clark Kent used to do subconsciously during the show Smallville. In the room, we can also catch a poster for Homelander, and one for Golden Boy just beside Marie's bed. In case you don't know, this is actually Patrick Schwarzenegger, following the footsteps of his dear old dad. Golden Boy becomes a big character in the entry, with his death becoming one of the major parts of the first three. Possessing thermonuclear powers, he's able to surround himself in an auric energy, which makes it look like he's a burning ball of flame. There's actually a lot of things going on with him in terms of comic inspiration, with the Human Torch being the most likely candidate. 
Johnny Storm was, was a bit of a young playboy too, and he's seen as the favourite son out of the group, much like how a golden boy is. However, later on we see a costume design for him, and I actually think this hints towards another character that might have inspired him. That is, the sentry who too deals with mental health issues, and I did think they may be going that route when he was getting the visions of Sam. The sentry has a darker side of his personality known as the Void which carries out evil acts and takes over control when his mind breaks. Now like I said, that's the vibe I got and I wonder if Sam's got telepathic powers due to him reaching out to his brother. Now, I'm not gonna say Golden Boy's fully bouncing off of that but I do think certain elements inspired what's going on. Sam is of course the student that ends up escaping later on and Andre and Marie obviously carry a lot of guilt over this. I think the central plot of the show will be about exposing what he went through and somewhat redeeming his brother's untimely death. Now from here we cut to the Red River sign which is ironic on a number of levels. Red River is what my mate's bird calls her period and Marie herself of course controls blood. This itself could create a Red River and she might pull lots of blood from other people to create a big wave down the line. Now Red River itself has actually appeared a number of times in the franchise. In the comics it was only ever name drop with just a sign being shown and nothing was ever cleared up about what it really was. However it was thought to be a black ops military contractor and its name was based off the back of Blackwater. Now in the season 1 finale when Madeline was pleading with Homelander she said that if she died then her son would be taken there. Cut to season 3 and Huey actually met a teleporting kid who was theorised to actually be Madeline's son. Later on when Marie's sitting in class a kid warps in but let me know if you think that's him because it, it, it will put that in the future. A Red River also showed up in the boys Diabolical and was a major part of episode 2. In it we watch several of the kids learning it was their parents that gave them Compound V and they blamed them for their debilitating superpowers. Hunting them down they murdered their families and I guess Marie could share some kinship with that. And we see a counselling session where someone talks about Starlight. Ever since Starlight left the Seven, I've just been inspired to speak my own truth. Placing this firmly after the events of Season 3. Later on we get some Maeve tributes, but interestingly nothing said about Black Noir, making me think there's been a cover up and someone using the mask. We know that he will be returning for Season 4, though they could go the zombie route that used to happen to some of the dead soups in the source material. Either way, Vord is integrated into every aspect of life and we see how the clocks in the school are made by the company. The kids are clearly being influenced into thinking that's the way to get out of there, with Brinkerhoff's book even being studied in class. Downstairs she sees a student being dragged off to Elmira, a Vort run rehabilitation centre that stops soup stepping out of line. Later on we learn this is what happens to kids that don't get adopted and I think in the series we'll discover what really happens there. Soups can't be let out in the world unchecked because the supervillain potential there would simply be too much. Thus at Red River adoption or god you becomes essential because otherwise they'd just be locked up there. You also see some Soups adult movies which we'll have to blur but they have appeared in the series before namely during that Lamplighter episode. Can't really read out all the titles but all the ones with Homelander talk about him cucking someone. This could be a nod to how he screwed Billy's wife with the vid even saying homie bangs a wife. There's also deep does her in the blowhole and Starlight pulls an A-train without actually being forced to have to do it in the comics on her first day in the seven. Yikes. Now in the teacher's room we also see a poster for Homelander in the deep with a Starlight one there trying to be inspiring. The teacher here is actually a carryover from season three with her being the same actress that showed Huey around. Now at this point Marie says... <laughs> I think you meant to say first black woman in the seven. And it's clear that she's trying to live up to her dad. In the campus video we meet some of the classmates such as Rufus and also Jordan Lee. As we learn they have the ability to switch genders so them saying they're super inclusive is kind of a thing a uni would lean into in their promo videos. Jordan is also an interchangeable name with it being something that can be used on a boy or girl. Sounds so like, sound like an old man there trying to learn new phrases but we meet the invisible student Maverick and also a telekinetic one in a wheelchair. Later on with Maverick they make a joke about him standing there with his dong out. Are you pitching a consent seminar with your dick out? Yes my dick is out. Common room at three. Oh well like we, we know from Translucent that he'd actually have to be doing this cause his cap and glasses show his clothes don't go invisible with him. Now lastly is Dean Shetty spouting off all kinds of over the top sales pitches that the boys of course love to make fun of. In the class we see a character I think might riff on Blue Devil but let me know below if you think it's someone else. Now the faculties at the school are also introduced with the school of crime fighting becoming a big place. 
There's the Crimson Countess for the performing arts, and she of course appeared in season 3, played by Laurie Holden. The Countess was seen as being a musical act, so it makes sense that she'd have this faculty named after her. She was also based on the Scarlet Witch, and they actually do a WandaVision joke later on in the entry. It's an elevated superhero thing, really a meditation on grief told through 70 years of sitcoms. There's also Lamplighter's School of Crime Fighting, with most of the seven coming directly from there. Homelander was actually trained in a lab, and though there's statues of him, he's never really mentioned in the school lineups. Also, I found it funny how A-Train and Maeve were ranked 1, whereas the Deep, Deep was just 6. Shetty also mentions how several students have gone on to Riverdale, pretty little liars, and so you think you've got super talent. Although the students are welcomed here, there's also clearly fear too, as we see reinforced security on the doors. News reports are also used to cut up the scenes, with us seeing the wake of the final battle in Season 3, which destroyed the Seven Tower. Blamed on the Russians, we also hear the defence for Homelander killing someone at the rally, which closed out the finale. His lawyer is going with a stand your ground angle, and we know from the videos that Prime's been releasing on YouTube that he is going to get away with it. At about the 18 minute mark in Episode 2, we also get a news report with Homelander's trial being put in place. A Maeve's death also hangs over things as well, and I wonder if it'll be on Earth that she's actually still alive. She's a big conversation topic though, with there being polls over whether Vought should continue selling Brave Maeve's vegetable lasagna. Speaking of selling, we also see the Vought run VBay selling a signed Funko Pop for Maeve that sits at $1900. You can of course buy this Funko in real life, and I actually own it, and I'll give it to you in the exchange for a thumbs up. Now from here we cut to Emma Shaw, an Ant-Man slash Wasp-esque character who's able to shrink herself down. However, she has to make herself sick in order to do this, which is a clear common on bulimia and women feeling like they have to look a certain way in order to be accepted. This is something that's touched upon throughout the episodes, with her story being used as a way to potentially empower women and get loads of views. Now we actually get a clue to her doing this early on, as we see her re-enter the room to greet Marie, showing she had to go to the bathroom. She's probably my, my favourite character, you know, and anyone who makes my thimble look bigger, I'm down to be mates with. Now her gerbil is also called David Caruso, a CSI character, which may be a nod to how they're training to fight crime. Now they do a little thing about how the windows don't open, which if you've ever been to a hotel and asked that, you, you might know why they lock them. We'll instantly get demonetized if I say it, but it also gives the idea that they're sort of trapped in a prison. Now that day at the arena, they finally see Golden Boy and his mate Andre. Known as Polarity, he's following in his father's footsteps, or rather being pushed towards having to become a soups. The theme of pushy parents is laced throughout these episodes, and the fact that the kids have powers is because they made the choice to inject their children with B. They were never going to be able to have a normal life because their parents were the ones who took that decision away from them, and you do kind of get the feeling that they're sort of the villains in this situation. Obviously, they still love and care for them, but some of the things they say and do, it makes it clear they have their own selfish goals. Now, Polarity's statue lines the campus, and it's clear that he's a big name amongst the other students. Both are basically Gen V's version of Magneto, and they're able to manipulate metal and the hearts of millions. Now, speaking of manipulation, it's at this point we also meet Golden Boy's girlfriend, Kate. Kate possesses push-up powers which allow her to manipulate someone's mind, and this is so that they do things against their will. In the psychic community, pushers are known to be able to do this, and there was even an X-File episode of the same name that had a villain with that ability. As far as comic book culture goes, I think she's sort of in vain with Wolverine's girlfriend in X-Men Origins, who could convince someone to do something simply through touch. At the end of that movie, she told William Stryker to keep walking, and we learn that Kate did the same thing to her brother, which caused him to go missing. The idea of the woods there thematically ties in with the woods, which the group of course end up investigating. Because of this, Kate also has to wear gloves, which I personally think is riffing on Rogue from the X-Men. Called in to see the Professor, Marie comes across Jordan, who gives her a bit of a hard time at first, but in the other episodes they get closer. Brink enters with a bang, and he comes off friendly at first, until we realise he's willing to scapegoat Marie to save his star students. In the courtyard, we can also catch a statue of Soldier Boy, but it looks like he's had red paint splashed over him. This might be because of the events of Season 3, and potentially he's seen in a bad light because of what went down. At this point we meet Golden Boy's brother Sam, who we learn escape from the woods. We get some scenes involving it, and we can see the walls are papered there to look like trees, which leads into what we'll talk about more later. Now, out in the courtyard the next day, we see the student in the wheelchair, and can also catch someone in a Homelander costume meeting up with him. 
Emma and Marie are both drinking jitter beans, the in-universe coffee house that appeared in episode 2 of the comics and also the TV series. At this point, we properly meet Justine, who talks about the WandaVision parody going out on Vault Plus. They also meet Robert Bazocchi's character, and they should call him Robert Small Cocky. Hey, 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 I'm a man. You're gonna kill me. Now in Brink's office, he talks about visiting Golden Boy's parents, which is a practice Professor X and Magneto used to do. It's a completely different relationship to what Edgar has with Homie, and it's clear he thinks he has the potential to surpass him. He presents him with an image of a costume that means he finally won't have to fight naked, and it's going to be a major difference to his life as a whole. Offered either Maeve or Starlight's apartment, he's making it to the top to set the world on fire. The Seven, of course, are also desperate for members, so it's not even like he has to be drafted. At this point, he hears his brother's voice, who becomes a ghost that haunts him for the rest of his life. Andre too pushes Marie into the future, coming up with names like Bloody Marie and also Coagula. Inviting her out, they end up hitting Vought Tower, whilst Emma stays in and reads her YouTube comments. I've seen worse, to be fair, and along the sidebar we can also catch several boys inspired videos from the deep. This is super sized me, one about eating a Vought burger for 30 days straight, a Vought coin one, one with Cameron Coleman owning the woke libs, and another below it about interviewing ex-woke Antifa. The back of her laptop also has Brave Maeve on, along with several stars just like her symbol. At Vought Tower, we see the construction to repair it continues and can catch cranes in the establishing shots. Here, Marie, for the first time, opens up about her family, having lied in the past to every other person. This is shared with Luke, who too talks about his brother being dead, and in the flashbacks in episode 3, we learn this was a cover story he was told, but no, it wasn't the case. Being vulnerable and sharing her secret can also be reflected in Luke later on, as he comes forth and teases the truth about what's happening in the woods. Saying his brother passed away, he's of course had to keep his mental illness a secret, and both share things with their siblings that have kept them apart. Luke is unable to see this because of the words, and in the case of Marie's, she refuses to speak to her. They both share several character similarities in this way, and I love how all the characters kind of have these shared themes between them. Emma goes down or up on that guy, and it is kind of humiliating. I think it sort of speaks to the boys in general and how the soups have to sell themselves in order to remain popular. They do lots of demeaning things throughout the shows and comics because they know they can be replaced easily if it comes down to it. That's why Homelander going against this in season 3 was so important because it finally showed that he was free from their control. Now that isn't exactly a good thing for the rest of humanity and in the club we see how soups can become outcasts if their powers go awry. Andre ends up slicing someone's throat, creating a similar wound to what Marie's mother suffered when her powers manifested. Actually saving her, this somewhat redeems her death, and I think, right, I think it might actually be the first time in the boys that a character has truly saved a life. I also think the coin and metal manipulation may be similar to Magneto, who used one as a weapon during X-Men First Class. The way he floats it is also similar to the TK users in Looper, but it has the potential to cause a shitload of trouble. Now Marie's saviour moment turns her into a viral sensation, but she's expelled after Brink whittles off a story about Fred McAllister who comes from Scarborough. Been there a couple of times but never heard this story and I couldn't find anything about it online. If you're from the area and know though, make sure you drop it below, but I think not actually being able to find anything kinda hammers home the point. He's a nobody who died saving his dog and he embodies the sacrifice that the soups would never actually make. He chalks it up to her actually being able to save her friends, but it's clear that she doesn't want to be thrown out of the school. Elsewhere, we see as Luke gets contacted by his brother and can catch a deep movie poster on the right for his film Maximum Kill Force. Mentally taken to the woods, this resembles the pictures that line the wall, and his brother Sam begs for help, which sends him off the deep end. That's not a deep pun. It doesn't even work. Anyway, either way, Golden Boy goes off the brink and cooks his mentor alive in his office. Caught by Marie, she ends up fleeing as Jordan buys her time by hitting that dick just like it's the like button. Now you might wonder how they're able to go against Golden Boy with just the gender changing powers, but Compound V also gives you enhanced human strength. Most of the users also get durability too, with the major powers tending to be what's unique to them. Now outside we see Andre advertising Turbo Rush, a train drink which appeared throughout the series. There's two media reporters with us meeting Jeff later on in episode 2 and we learn he's the social media manager of God University who got his injuries tripping on the red carpet. Getting Golden Boy self-destructing is of course a major story but he leaves Andre with a clue that makes him look to his dad's statue. 
As we cut to the credits, we get the song Celebrity Skin by Hull, which itself discusses all the trappings of fame. Now this is followed by a special message from Ashley, who too blames Golden Boy's death on his chronic drug use. This is a similar story to what they did with Drummer Boy, and it segues perfectly into a trailer for the season. However, as for us, we're going to dive into episode 2, which opens with a cover of Nothing Else Matters. Seeing a sign for Black Noir saying no looksy lose, this also leads me to believe his death's being covered up. Now this sign kind of resembles the Second World War poster, namely the loose lip sync ships one about keeping quiet. Something similar is done at the 7 minute 20 mark in episode 3, with a Crimson Counters poster basically saying the same thing. The blood and gore is being washed up, with it becoming clear the campus just want to brush it under the rug. Back at Vore Tower, Ashley does a little, little on the nose joke about having to torch the Golden Boy action figures that were due for delivery. Speaking with the school council, we meet Andre's dad, Polarity Senior, and Ashley shuts down the idea of talking about how Jordan Lee helped out in the fight. Due to them being a non binary Asian, she doesn't think it's going to sell to some of their base, which Vort's currently divided over due to the Starlight and Homelander situation. During season 2 episode 3 we saw as Huey and co had a road trip and travelled past the homeland a painting with a confederate flag as a cape. This shows that the corporations have to pander to all kinds of people to be successful and it's something we've seen culture wars being fought over in the real world. The big PR disaster is what happens if the woods gets uncovered and it's going to be way more of a problem than the compound the expose was. A brink dying means Marie gets to stay and she starts to enjoy the celebrity that comes with being in the top 10. She's the first freshman to ever do it, further pushing her along to what her dad looked up to. Now Jordan's then drop down, and outside we see people at the Brink statue taking selfies with a girl having missed a fantastic like powers to stretch out her arms. At this point we also meet Rufus wearing a red hat that says Make America Safe. It's clearly ripping off the Make America Great Again caps, and Homelander and Stormfront push this idea at their rallies. We also see Rufus's pals wearing homie t-shirts and this is so that they can show their support. One also says sorry snowflake, showing the direction that his followers are going. Now upon using her powers, Kate's eyes get bloodshot, similar to the nosebleeds that happened to the psychics during Firestarter. As for Marie, she's blowing up on Twitter and we see a photo she'd arranged for both her and Andre. Polarity Senior shows off his costume on his phone and it's clear that Andre is wrapped up in what his father wants for him. I feel that's a theme running through the show, with the same picture being up in Andre's room. Maria is of course trying to live up to what her dad wanted too, with her desperate to become the first black woman in the seven. We also meet Emma's mother in episode 3, and learn that she was the one who taught her how to throw up. We learn she was a host of the Vought Shopping Network before she was fired, so now she's pushing her daughter directly into that life. As for Golden Boy, I think you can tell he was pushed into a life set out by his surrogate father Brink, but he managed to break free from this to meet a tragic end. Also, with who Patrick's dad is in real life, I wonder if that helped to, to channel his performance. Now Marie's dad's gone and all that's left is Andre, and I think this season will see him becoming his own man. Marie also indicates that she could become her own woman too, but instead she doesn't go off script to admit Jordan Lee helped her out. This is of course a comment on talk shows and how the entire questions and answers are scripted in advance. No curveballs are allowed to be thrown and everything's all just PR with Marie even saying this in regards to selfies. You can say literally anything to them and they will still take the photo. I feel like this is a comment on the soups in general with them just being corporate puppets created to make money. They're corporate shells, you idiot. Her giving Jordan credit is very much her potentially sacrificing her career, showing that she could have what it takes to become a hero, but she doesn't decide to do it. Now in the drama hall, we get one of my favourite side characters from the series, with Dawn of the Seven director Adam Burke making an appearance. Based very, very loosely on Zack Snyder, according to the wiki, his original Dawn of the Seven suffered constant interference behind the scenes, with the Burke Cup being something that social media demanded. When it was released, it included brand new footage and a recasting of Stormfront because of the whole twist that we did not see coming. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! Now the reason that he's teaching here is because he had his own Me Too moment, in which he showed his dick to Minka Kelly. In real life, she spoke out about rejecting Harvey Weinstein, and they're clearly doing a comment on that with Burke being involved in Hollywood. Now we then get some channel flicking and can see Robert Singer's campaign in full effect with Victoria Newman as his running mate. Victoria is actually based on the character Vic the Veep, who in the comics was the VP that caused the president's death. Taking over the role, this vault plant gave the company unrestricted access to military funding, which I think is a long game involving Victoria. 
They, of course, have a whole new network covering the election, and the right-wing station that Cameron Coleman runs haven't really shut down their campaign. This will likely lead to the swing states going in her favour, which will put Singer in the hot seat and her at his side. Speaking of Cameron, we can catch him reporting on Golden Boy's parents, who he puts across have barricaded themselves in their home. In reality, they're of course just mourning, but putting the blame on them shifts suspicions from the woods, and it has the eyes of the public looking elsewhere. Liam ends up ditching Emma, and thus she then teams up with her new best buddy Justine. This all happens in the School of Crime Fighting Lab, which feels like it's building off the back of Crime Analytics at Bore Tower. Talking about how she'd love a Vorderberger, Emma says she's not hungry, and this is likely due to the association with her eating disorder. This is something she confesses later on, and both her and Marie's powers in many ways revolve around them harming themselves in order to be unleashed. On her laptop, when they're picking the scenes, we see several posters from Dawn of the Seven and also Termites movies. You might have noticed the big crazy love poster too by Emma's bed, and on the screen we get his filmography and all the stuff he's starred in. Fourth movie along, we can catch Pocket Romance, which was mentioned during one of Cameron Coleman's news reports. Termite, like, you know you know exactly who Termite is. If you, I'm going to be honest, mate. No one who's seen The Boys could ever forget that scene, yeah? Not, not, uh, burned in my brain forever. And yeah, it looks like Gen V's carrying on the dick tradition. Now, the other films include Nubian Prince, a Black Panther parody who appeared in the comics. He was also mentioned in season one of The Boys and had an entire episode centered around his family during The Boys' Diabolical. There's also the deep movie Rising Tide, which itself was a parody of the first Aquaman film. They also bring up Brian Singer's parties, which Termite used to attend. And yeah, I'll, pro I'll probably get demonetized if I talk about what happened at them, but there's a reason he, he doesn't really work anymore. Now we can also catch Queen Maeve on the bong, and Vought's likely profiting off her death, which could end up blowing over. We learn Justine's YouTube channel can barely crack 10k, and the expose of Emma pushes her beyond that. Hers is called Spilling the Tea, which is likely a parody on the Tea Spill channel. I know, guys, if you're watching this, do a parody of me, please. I'd, I'd love to be included. Now we see Marie's visiting Dean Shetty and get a line that constantly pops up with it talking about how superheroes all act like they're made of steel. This is something Marie repeats and Polarity Senior also says to his son. I feel like this mantra may have a deeper layer to it, with it being used to repress feelings and emotions so the soups don't have to deal with the truth. They're all experiments who are led towards this life so a company could profit off their image and abilities. When you think about it, they're kind of enslaved, with the only prospects being either popularity or going to Elmira. None of them actually have true agency, and I think the steel metaphor may tie to Andre's abilities. He of course can manipulate metal, and it would make sense if he's the one who broke the entire system. Down in the basement, we watch as the Dean travels to the woods, which is where she encounters a trapped Sam getting injections in his back. In the back of his room, we can also catch a poster for Payback, which is the team Soldier Boy led that we saw flashbacks of in Season 3. Now Kate and Andre then go to Luke's room, which has the word murderer spray painted on the door. Elsewhere, we see as Emma's been exposed, and she has to deal with her secret now being out in the open. In the back of this scene, we can catch a Crimson Countess poster, with a tagline being Memento Audre Semper. This means Remember to Dare, which, yeah, if you've ever been to drama school, the motto's like this, there's always some shit like that. Now we can catch Justine getting a rat girl to Nancy Reagan her tail. Oh yeah, baby. It's Nancy Reagan, that shit. And recently it came out that she was the throat goat. That night, Kate and Andre start to uncover the conspiracy by seeing a destroyed camera and doing a Freudian thing with them getting a recording from Luke in the Polarity statue. Revealing the truth about Sam, they talk about how Luke said he died in Sage Grove, and at the start of episode 3, we end up visiting the complex. This location comes from the main series, and it's where the more dangerous soups were locked up at. Love Sausage gets a little cameo though, can't show it, uh, but this is setting it up before the events of season 2. Now in terms of more recent history, this is where they developed B24, which allowed the user to get superpowers for 24 hours. The first version of V could only safely be given to children, whereas V24 can also be used by adults. That night the show goes on with Hayley Miller, and the heroes get classed as a group known as the Guardians of Godolkin. No prizes for guessing what that's a reference to, but it later gets shortened to Guardian after Andre fails to show. After seeing some of Luke's body still lodged in the pavement, he decides to become a true hero and try to get to the bottom of things. Now, I did Google the rest of the names on Brink's laptop because normally they'll throw in a production assistant or, or something when they do these kinds of moments. Unfortunately, I couldn't find anything, So, but if you, if you know, let me know. Uh, but we can catch the words on the left in the folders and Sam's profile. 
Due to the guards coming in, he not only misses the show, but he lets his father down, who of course saw this as his big chance. Now Hayley Miller throws Marie off by mentioning her sister, who said that she didn't want anything to do with her. Throughout the episodes, Marie's been hit with constant flashes of her parents, but now she's had to suppress all that for this pompous reality TV thing that she thinks she wanted. Hitting her marks perfectly, she says she's made of steel, showing the Dean's indoctrination is finally getting through to her. Returning to her room, we see several items of red clothing, showing how they're already pushing her to becoming this big blood-themed hero. However, it's too much, and we have her moments with an eye reflecting Emma vomiting, which is unfortunately... It's unfortunately a subject I kind of have to skirt around due to YouTube monetization. However, this metaphorically shows the cost that comes with being in the limelight, and it often ravages one's mental health. When a thousand people can tell you in an instant that your like button joke was terrible, it just gets to you, and it feels even worse when you know they didn't even hit it. Now, this is something the pair continue to talk about during episode 3, and it's very clear that they are in denial about it. They say it's because it's part of their powers, but moments like this, they go way beyond that. Now, Emma's also seen at her smallest during this, which highlights how little she feels about herself. Now, we see how Black Ops at the Woods is, with the guards even killing the school staff member that comes across it. We actually see a missing poster for him in episode 3 at about the 11 minute mark, which is such a, uh, it's a very, you know, it's, it's dark humour, but it, it is nice that they paid attention to this. Now Andre sees this and a guard uses a sonic emitter on him, which is similar to how the boys use sonic weapons to disorientate Homelander. Kate comes to save the day through using her pusher abilities, and I thought it was pretty funny how all this stuff was just like getting people to smack themselves in the balls and stuff things up their arse. Now this causes her to have pushed too far, and we jump to the final episode where we encounter the Sage Grove Center and see why Sam was moved to the woods. Kate was actually the one who sedated him, and thus the guilt lies at her feet about what went on. The death of Luke and grief helps her and Andre grow closer, with a pair getting it on after she comes to. And comes to, hey? Fuck that, you know? And after Marie has a heart-to-heart -heart with Emma, she also has one with the Dean, who downplays the truth about her sister's comments. We don't know if that's really the case, and she could also be manipulating her like she accuses the news anchor of doing. Her interview is studied and picked apart, and it shows the students how to act, which makes sense that they'd kind of push these lessons because they are selling a corporate product. Now, the person doing the real heroics is of course Andre, but his dad unfortunately doesn't see it that way. All he's interested in is the glitz and glamour, and he of course still holds a lot of bitterness over not getting into the Seven. We don't know exactly when he tried, but judging by his age, I'm guessing it would have been before A-Train. This would have made him the first black member of the team, but instead he lives a life where he has to live vicariously through his son. Now, there's been a lot of back and forth over what happened with him, and how he had a kid, because Ryan is the first soup to be born from another soup. Thus, I think Polarity Senior obviously injected his son knowing what would come from it, and it is pretty messed up when you get down to it. This idea of controlling parents is exemplified in Emma's mother, and also Jordans who arrive when they're in the middle of doing something. In the background, we can hear What a Man by Salt and Pepper, which you got you guys are smart, yeah. You you can figure out the subtext there. Now we see a guy showing off their kitty pride powers and walking through a wall, and Jordan almost always appears as a man to his parents because that's how they feel they'll make them proud. This carries on the idea of how the kids have to suppress themselves to be a certain way, and I definitely feel like the the whole parental theme is the loudest when it comes to Jordan. I wonder if all the sex stuff with them will have them being a girl because of the whole multiple things that my wife's told me about with her ex-boyfriends. Now when they want to reveal the truth, they turn into a girl, which shows a true person that Jordan wants to be. Her dad's embarrassed and ashamed by this though, and he feels like Jordan's punishing him every time they become a woman. It's clearly a comment on how some parents may react upon learning their child may be trans, and it's sort of like how the X-Men themes changed over the years to fit different aesthetics. The scene with Bobby and X2 was clearly a play on a child coming out of their parents, so it makes sense to have this kind of subtext in the show. At the fundraiser, we see how charity bids are held for an evening with the deep, but yeah, we've seen what that guy gets up to. Signed A trainers are being given away too, and Marie can't talk about the truth with her parents because of the whole psycho angle that could come from it. I do think this will be weaponized later on to control her, and if she goes to expose the woods, they'll threaten to expose her. Now she just says they're with Doctors Without Borders, and this is a real-life charity that provides humanitarian medical care. Pushed towards starring in a reality TV show, Emma sees how her actual mental health issues in life are going to be turned into a commodity for people's entertainment. 
This exploitation is similar to what Justine did, and it's kind of like how they commercialized Maeve's sexuality so that they could just make money. The corporations, they don't care about the issues, but they see aligning themselves with these causes as a way to make profit. Now Marie's back in a red dress, and this again ties into the powers and acts as a sort of reminder of the Red River she came from. Asking Emma to help her pee, this sort of plays off the first episode where they joked about how the pants she wore didn't allow you to have a wee. Later on, Emma's recruited to infiltrate the woods, and I have to say, I thought her and Sam hit it off. He was obviously obsessed with his brother in episode 1, and I think it would be a nice direction to take things to have them be a thing. Now in the basement, we see an orderly pushing along a trolley with a bandaged up arm due to the dangers of her job. There's also a flame powered soup called Betsy before we finally get to see Sam. We can see a black noir poster up in his room as well, and the cartoonish animals on the wall also resemble the visions that the character used to have. Answering a bunch of questions on a Homeland Aduve, she did peg me a bit because my favourite movie is The Godfather and yeah, I'm a, I'm a white guy. So funny her having to not know the questions and the fact she brings up Shawshank Redemption could obviously play off the fact that he's a prisoner trying to escape. His favourite movie though, it's Waterworld, which could speak to him being someone in isolation that's brought back to humanity due to the people he has to protect. At the fundraiser, we get some God alumni including A-Train and The Deep, but I don't know why, but whenever this guy talks, it just cracks me up. I'm not defending his actions though. Now it's during this that Andre tells his dad about the words, who already knows. I feel like he's going to have to make a decision to toss his ambitions to the side and actually do the right thing and become a hero. Now the woods are sent into lockdown after they realise someone's there. Emma is shoved between some graphic novels, which include Wonder Wing, which might be a play on the Nightwing parody Swing Wing, Payback and Queen Maeve, who's part of Vought International, a play on the JLI. Emma ends up killing a god by crawling through his ear, and we close out the episode with the pair surrounded by several of them. I feel like this is symbolic on a number of levels, as it's very much a baptism through blood that transforms the character. This brings things full circle from episode 1, where we saw it was Marie in that position. Both had their powers killing someone, the theme of blood, and this has taken them into a new direction, bringing it beautifully to a close. Also, I know that Sam gets something injected into his back at one point, and potentially they could be looking at ways to weaken the soups. I think that would make the most sense, as it would mean the rogue ones like these could be shut down without posing a danger to society. Elmira was hinted at in episode 1, and this would bring things back from that. Either way, it's a big way to close the episode out, and I think next week we'll see their escape attempt with the pair breaking out. Sam said that he knew all the security codes of the doors, and this will help the pair both get out. Now, as for what I think's going on with Brink and Co, if we look at the comics, it could speak to what's happening. Full spoilers ahead for them, so if you're in the middle of reading the boys and just don't want to know, then I highly recommend you turn off now. Now, it turned out in the comics that Godolkin had actually been abusing his students, and this dark secret was what Huey uncovered during his time with the G-Men. Abducting children from their families, he'd built up a system funded by Vought where he could live out his sick desires whilst providing soups for the company. Most of them dealt with mental issues and acted extremely immature and unable to fully process what had really happened to them. Huey and the boys were eventually caught out by Godolkin and he then ordered his G-Men to just wipe them out. However, during this moment, Vought American SWAT team members showed up and gunned down Godolkin and all of his students. Turned out that Vought had learned what was happening at the mansion and fearing that it could harm the business, they decided to take them out. Now whether they go that route remains to be seen, but I thought it was at least worth bringing up at some point in the video. Either way, I really enjoy these first three entries, and it kind of alleviated all the doubts that I had over the show. Hearing that we were getting a spin-off with all new characters set in a university, you know, I was excited, but I did worry they might just be milking the property. However, this managed to recapture everything I love about the main show. All these characters are really well fleshed out, and it's a great coming-of-age story that deals with a lot of different complexities. You've got pushy parents, fame, and wondering whether your goals are even what you really want from life. There's some of that classic over-the-top gross humour as well, and when they had Emma bouncing up and down on that dude, I knew we weren't getting a dumbed-down version. I think the third entry was probably the weakest of the three, but even then they're batting at a really high average. In my opinion, gonna say it, I think this might be the best first three episodes of a comic book show that we've had all year. All the characters are really memorable and unique, and there's the constant tongue-in-cheek satire that I, I love what the series is known for. Gen V didn't disappoint, and it really feels like the boys are back in town. Terrible pun, but yeah, what a great way to start the show, and I can't wait to see where they go next time. 
Now again, we will be back to cover the episodes week by week, and we'll no doubt drop some videos in between with theories and character breakdowns, so make sure you subscribe. Can't say theories without doing that stupid voice, but yeah, please like the video, and if you want to support the channel as a member of the Spoiler Society, then please click the join button. You'll get early access to videos every week, and it goes such a long way to helping us make these breakdowns. Now if you want to get some heavy spoilers merch, we've also got our t-shirt line located just below the video that'll let you pick up tops like our Theory Time one, House of the Dragon stuff, Marvel tees, and a lot more. We drop new designs on there all the time too, so definitely keep an eye out for them, and yeah, thank you everyone who's bought one. Now if you want something else to watch, we've got a video on screen right now that you should definitely head over if you've still got time. I know we've been here rambling a lot, it's been a very long video, but there was a lot of stuff to talk about and I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Out of the way, a huge thank you for sitting through it. I've been Paul and I'll see you next time. Take care. Peace.